So I am reading the question for you. The Metris is a trader buying and selling goods on credit. The following information was available on 31st March 2014. Uh, the year end for Demetrius is 31st March 2014. Uh, revenues there, 300,000 revenues also referred to as sales. Then we have inventory at 31st March. This is a closing inventory because it is dated at year end. Then we have purchases, capital, bank. If bank is a debit balance, this means it is a bank balance. If bank would have been a credit, it would have been an overdraft. We have trade payables, we have trade receivables. GP to sales percentage, this is GP margin because it is based on sales and if the examiner mentioned that GP upon cost of sales, this would become a markup percentage. A markup is applied on cost of sales in order to calculate a gross profit and margin is applied to sales in order to calculate gross profit. Okay, the first requirement that we have, we need to calculate cost of sales. Then we need to calculate opening inventory. Then there is uh, some of the theoretical requirements as well. So I must suggest you should keep the question in hand so that you can refer to when it is needed. We need to calculate cost of sales. Now there are several ways of calculating cost of sales. Uh, basically the method that we normally use is opening inventory at purchases less closing inventory is equal to cost of sale. Now the problem here arises that is that that there is no opening inventory because if there is no opening inventory we cannot find cost of sale directly. Now we'll be going for some other method and the other method is that as you may be aware if we deduct uh, cost of sales from the sale figure we get gross profit. Now if we have a revenue that is sales, we already have a revenue figure. How much is it? 300,000. Uh, we do not have a cost of sale. We need to find this cost of sale. But if somehow I can find this gross profit, uh, I am able to calculate cost of sale by reverse working. Okay. So this is 20% is given in the question, my dear student. This 20% is basically a margin. So let me see if you can... Is the question visible to you? What we need to do, we need to multiply 20% margin in order to get a gross profit. Uh, now, as you can see, 20% is there. If we apply 20% to 300,000, I will be getting gross profit of 60,000. Now, there are two things. One is uh, revenue is 3 lakh and GP is 60,000. Now, what I need to do, uh, I need to reverse work with this and I need to calculate uh, cost of sales. Now, I'm showing some other working to you and I'm just justifying the fact that why I actually did multiply 300,000 by 20% in order to find a gross profit. As you have already studied the ratio previously and that was GP margin. Now, what was the formula for GP margin? The formula for GP margin is gross profit upon sales revenue multiplied by 100. Uh, but a GP margin is already given in the question that is 20%. We do not have gross profit, but we have a revenue that is 300,000. So if I need to uh, calculate this gross profit, what will I need to do? Uh, I will be multiplying this figure instead of dividing. Okay. So this 300,000 that is right now being divided, it will be multiplied by 20% in order to get this gross profit. So I have done the same here if I have applied 300,000 uh, into 20% in order to get this 60,000. Now now uh, this thing is very easy. If I am selling something for 300,000 and out of that 60,000 is my profit. So what will be my cost of sales if I deduct both of these items I will be getting cost of sales easily. So this was basically the first requirement uh, that is 240,000. The second requirement that we have been asked for is opening inventory. Uh, now, as you may be aware, uh, the format for cost of sales is basically opening inventory at purchases, then less closing inventory. Uh, so, we'll be getting cost of sale. Although there are some other items as well, such as carriage inward, return outward, but in this question, these are not there. So, opening inventory is basically missing. We need to find this out. And the purchase is already given in the question, as you can see, that is 170,000. Closing inventory is also there. Uh, with the amount of 50,000 and we have already done with cost of sale. We have already found out cost of sale that is 240,000. So what we can do now, we can find this opening inventory figure. How? We'll be doing reverse working. We'll be starting with cost of sales and the closing inventory that is usually deducted will be added 
and the purchases figure that is usually added will be subtracted in order to get the opening inventory okay now you can also check this is a simple math question uh, if we uh, add both opening and purchases this would be 290 and out of that 290 if we did a closing we will be getting cost of sale that is 240,000 so this was basically a way to calculate cost of sorry the way to calculate opening inventory using cost of sales now the second requirement uh, that is B part that we have uh, this is a theoretical requirement and it is asking uh, such as two possible effects of holding too much inventory if we are holding too much inventory let us think of uh, suppose that it is our own business and let us consider your own business and if we have for example if we have a mobile phone shop gadget shop and if we have stocked up uh, so much mobile phones so what will happen uh, there are certain things that happen that we will be needing to incur some of the holding costs. Holding costs include the rent and the electricity and the security and the lightning. These are all holding costs and the mobile phone will also get uh, expired or not expired basically out of date because the new generation, new technology comes more often. Therefore, so the old mobile phones will get out of date uh, uh, as the new technology comes in and the new generation comes in. So therefore this will be a problem. Uh, there can be a robbery uh, in our shop. Therefore there can be a theft uh, and we will be losing stock because of that as well. And there can be uh, some opportunity cost issues as well because uh, we have uh, stuck all our money in our stock. So if we could have invested somewhere else we could also earn some of the profits in that. So there are some of the reasons that you can write. First of all, I have written about stock holding costs such as security, heating, lightning and all of this cost. Then inventory becomes obsolete or out of date or maybe expired. If we talk about medicine or food, there are perishable goods. These expire over time. So what other uh, options can be? Although we need to write only two in the examination, but we are just discussing some other options as well. Uh, then deterioration of the inventory that is damage inventory may be damaged due to some cases and what else can be there can be a risk of theft yes there can be theft and we can lose our inventory opportunity cost of money tied up now opportunity cost you must have uh, studied this previously in business maybe business studies so opportunity cost is called a value of second best alternative if you have two options and if you choose the best option uh, by choosing the best option, you forego the opportunity to choose the second best option. Okay, so the opportunity cost for number one option is the opportunity that is lost with the second option. Okay, so this is basically the opportunity cost. If we invest in inventory, we cannot invest anywhere else. So there can be liquidity problems for the business as well. So these were basically some effects of holding too much inventory if you have stopped too much inventory. Now let's move to the next part of the question and for the next uh, I have sent you the image. Uh, we need to calculate a working capital ratio that is current. So the formula for current ratio working capital ratio is current assets upon current liabilities. So in an examination question you need not write the formula. But the thing is important that is the workings. Workings are important. Formula, you, must, you can skip the formula but not the workings. So let us uh, go back to the first part of the question and see what are the current assets in this question that we do have. Better for current assets, we have closing inventory that is 50,000. And what other things that we have other than closing inventory? Uh, for current assets, we have bank balance because it is a debit balance. And we also have some trade receivables that is 11,000. So there are basically three current assets and current liabilities are liabilities that are due to be repaid during the next year. So we have trade payables. We have only one liability. It can be other payables as well and it can be a bank overdraft as well. Now if I add up all of the current assets, these are 66 I guess. And if I, uh, add, there is only one current liability that is 60. So 66 upon 60,000, this would uh, result in an answer of 1.10. So why I am writing 1.10 instead of 1.1? Because the examiner has specifically asked us to go for two decimal places. Although 1.1 and 1.10 theoretically means the same thing, but we have to follow what the examiner is saying. We need to maintain it for two decimal places. Okay.
so we will won't be leaving it here till 1.10 rather we will be adding a ratio 1 in this now what does this ratio 1 means ratio 1 my dear students mean for each dollar of current liability we have current assets of 1.1 dollar means current assets are 10% uh, more than as we have current liability so this one would always be constant uh, it cannot be 1.10 ratio 0.5 or 1.1 ratio 2 or ratio 3 okay whatever the answer that we are getting we will be just adding ratio 1 so ratio 1 means for each dollar of current liability this one represents the denominator 60,000 and this 1.1 represents the numerator that is current assets of 66,000 okay so now the question here arises that what should be the current ratio ideally ideally our current ratio should be 2 ratio 1 okay 2 ratio 1 is the ideal ratio if there is more than that you can go up till 3 if the ratio is more than 3 ratio 1 you must say that the resources are being wasted resources are being underutilized and uh, we are losing money that there are some idle funds okay so liquidity should be maximum rate, current ratio should be 3 ratio 1 and minimum should be 1.5 if the ratio is going below 1.5 this is the minimum limit we will say that the resource uh, the liquidity of the company is in danger mean business is in the risk of being bankrupt okay going out of business or a business is going to be wind up soon it is also known as wind up okay after current ratio we need to find quick ratio in this question uh, as you may have the data in hand as a quick ratio the formula for quick ratio is basically current asset minus closing inventory upon current liability this is a formula for quick ratio although you do not need to write the formula in the exam only the workings so if we deduct inventory from the current assets the assets that we are left with would be quick assets now what are quick assets my dear students quick assets are those current assets that does not include inventory or those current assets that would be quickly converted into cash so if you have cash it is already in the cash form if you have bank balance you can always go to the bank and withdraw money from that your bank account and if you have a trade receivable trade receivable will sooner or later uh, uh, will pay you the amount due so therefore these are all liquid assets inventory is an illiquid asset because it takes very much time to sell off the inventory uh, and this thing can easily be understood during this pandemic situation because all of the business majority of the business are closed or locked down and those who are open also they are unable to move the inventory very fast because the public is not there on the roads and there are very few customers to buy your inventory right now okay other than the grocery items that are need of the day so the current assets we have already calculated that is 66,000 and out of these current assets we will be deducting the closing inventory that is 15,000. Now we are only left with 16,000 that is 1, 6, 16,000 of quick assets and I will be dividing it with trade payables that is current liability. So the answer that I am getting in the calculator is 0.26 something so I will be rounding off to 0.27. And I will not leave it till 0.27. I will be adding ratio 1 into this. So what does 0.27 ratio 1 means? 0.27 ratio 1 means for each dollar of current liability, we have quick assets of 0.27. We have quick assets of 0.27. So what should be the ideal quick ratio, my dear students? Ideally, the quick ratio should be 1 ratio 1. And if you want to go up, the maximum limit that we are required to keep, required to maintain is 2 ratio 1. And the minimum limit should be 0.7. And if the quick ratio is less than 0.7, we can comment that the liquidity of the business is in the danger and the business is in the risk of uh, not meeting their liabilities when due and the business can be uh, vulnerable to getting liquidated or going bankrupt okay so these are the basically comments that we can give on quick ratio but the comment that we are being asked are about current ratio and not the quick ratio let's write something about the current ratio uh, as you may be aware that ideally current ratio should be 2 ratio 1 but in this scenario we have only 1.1 ratio 1 now let us comment on this the current ratio part 
I have also written the ideal maximum and minimum for you. We have already discussed that ideal current ratio should be 2 ratio 1. Maximum it should be 3 and minimum it should be 1.5. I am talking about the current ratio. Now what about the quick ratios? Ideally quick ratio should be 1. Okay 1 ratio 1. Maximum should be 1 plus that is 2. This is 2. This is 1 plus 3 and 1 and 1 plus 2 and minimum it should be 0.7. Now right now I am worried about the current ratio. Ideally it should be 2 but mine it is less than 1.5 therefore the liquidity is in danger. We can write current ratio is low as compared with the yardstick that is benchmark of 2 ratio 1. What is yardstick benchmark? Yardstick and benchmark is the ideal or the expected result and we need to compare our figures with this yardstick or benchmark. So ideally we should have 2 ratio 1 but we have figure less than that so therefore I am writing it is low. Or we can also write something like that that current ratio is low and why is that so mainly due to high level of trade tables. As you can see my dear students in this question we have trade receivable of 11,000 but the trade payable is 60,000. It is around 5 times more than 5 times okay. Trade receivable is only 11,000 but our trade payable is more than 5 times and it stood at 60,000. So therefore the current ratio is low and the main reason for that is we have high levels of trade payables. We are just uh, accumulating our trade payables and not paying them since a long time therefore we have built up a huge amount of trade payables and now we are worried about the liquidity of the business. Now in this question in the last part we have a table and for that what we need to do we need to see uh, there are some of the proposals Demetrius took the following actions okay these are not basically proposals these are actions taken by Demetrius and we need to say uh, we need to see what is the effect of these actions that will be on our current assets on our current liabilities and on current ratio now let us uh, do the first one although the examiner has already solved the first one for you but we need to understand what does this mean in the first of the part examiner says repaid a $40,000 long term loan beta if I am repaying the loan the entry would be liability loan would be debited and bank account would be credited Although the loan is a non-current liability, it should not affect our current uh, ratio. But the bank balance that is reduced, so therefore our current asset will reduce. Although loan would not come here because loan is a basically a non-current liability. So there are two things. If you can see the current assets and current ratio, these are basically directly proportional. What does this mean? This means if current assets goes up, our current ratio also goes up. This is a direct relationship between two. These are first cousins, these are both. And if the current asset will go down, our current ratio would also go down. Okay. Then what about the current liability and current ratio? These are basically enemies of one another and these have an inverse relationship. What does this mean? This means this is a live or die situation. If I live, you die. If you live I will die okay so this is a battleground for both of them if current liability goes up current ratio goes down and if current liability goes down current ratio would go up so this is basically relationship between them as you can see in here as well if current asset goes up current ratio also goes up if current assets goes down current ratio would also go down this, this is a friendship between both of them if you live, I will also live. If you will die, I will also die with you. Okay, these are just like lovers. And then what about them? These are the direct relationship between current assets and current ratio. And between the current liability and current ratio, this is an inverse relationship. Okay, just the relationship between a hero and a villain. Okay, if the current liability goes up, so the current ratio would go down and vice versa. Okay, because it is in the denominator, therefore it is an inverse effect. So as you can see, if current assets are going down, current ratio also goes down. Because this is a in decimals, we do not need to write the amount here, just need to write increase in degree. Now the second option is that we have bought assets 
ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड ऑन नॉन करंट एसेट ऑन क्रेडिट इफ यू आर बाइंग नॉन करंट एसेट ऑन क्रेडिट द एंट्री वुड बी नॉन करंट एसेट्स डेबिट एंड लाइबिलिटी वुड बी क्रेडिट ऑल दो द नॉन करंट एसेट्स वुड नॉट कम इन अ करंट रेशो बिकॉज दीज आर नॉन करंट एसेट्स दीज आर नॉन करंट दीज आर फिक्स इन नेचर बट द लाइबिलिटी दैट इज बींग जनरेटेड ऑन द परचेज ऑफ दोज नॉन करंट एसेट इज बेसिकली अ करंट लाइबिलिटी now let me explain you with the help of an example uh, you have a for example a cousin who has a showroom of motor vehicles automobiles so what you did you need to buy a motor vehicle you went to him and you asked for a second hand car and it was for example 25 lakhs okay 2.5 million car uh, he showed you few of the cars and one of which you selected and you said that okay i'm taking it and i'll uh, let you know if i'm keeping it with you and and then i'll pay for it okay so he was basically your first cousin he gave you the car uh, after much selection you took a car and you went uh, driving it home happily and after few days maybe a week or 10 days your cousin called so dear what about the car did you like it did the family like it you said yes everything is all well and i'm keeping that car okay then he hang up the phone and then he called you again after one week uh, just as to inquire about his money basically and he saying uh, how are you uh, my friend how is the car working and are you enjoying and you are saying yes i am very well and the car is working perfectly fine now he asks you dear what about the payment when will you pay for me pay to me for this car and what you did and the answer that you gave was a surprise and you said beta uh, my dear this car is basically a non current asset and the life of this car is basically at least 10 years so i will be paying you for this car after 10 years okay because this car is a non current asset therefore i am also buying it on a long long term basis okay so the liability would be also a long term so will your cousin accept this no he will say beta yaar it is a hard cash item this is a toyota car it can uh, it is a ever credit card it can be sold in cash anytime as i want okay so i am not selling this car to you on a non current liability basis this is the liability that is a current liability okay so I just told the scenario so you understand this uh, so non current asset there is no effect on non current asset because if we are buying a non current asset car the no fat on the non concept but the current liability would increase why because you have to pay for this car no matter it is the non current said you have to pay for it as soon as possible so our current liability would increase by 20 so if the current liability is increasing so current ratio would be decrease okay because there are inverse relationship between these two of them then we have sold inventory for 20000 on credit the cost of which is 15000 the inventory that cost at 15000 we are selling it for 20000 so there are two transactions here uh, when we set, sold the inventory for 20000 our debtors would increase by 20000 but our inventory that is stock would decrease by 15 beta one thing is coming that is debtor is increasing by 20 but the stock inventory is decreasing by 15 so overall as you can see 5000 positive figure we are getting overall current assets are increasing by 5000 how trade receivables are increasing by 20 and inventory is decreasing by 15 so overall you can see there is an increase by 5000 if we have sold inventory we would have trade receivable and not trade payables okay so there will be no effect on trade payable if current assets are increasing and so will our current ratio would also increase because these both are direct in nature okay if current asset is increasing our current liability is also increasing now uh, although the question here is over let me solve a few more uh, requirement for you and one of which is trade receivable turnover now receivable turnover what does this mean this has been added uh, in our ci examination syllabus curriculum receivable turnover is also known as average collection period it means how long it takes on average for our customers to pay the debts that they owe to us so the formula for trade receivable turnover although it's not required in this question but i've just solved for the sake of practice so the formula is trade receivables also known as debtors previously divided by credit sales into 365 okay So the trade receivables that we basically have is eleven thousand dollars trade receivables. It's given in the question. 
and the revenue that we have is 300,000. So if the examiner does not mention that if it is a credit sale or cash sale, we will always assume that it is a credit sales, okay, unless otherwise stated. Now the trade receivables divided by credit sales multiplied by 365, this would uh, give us answer 13 point something days. So I will be rounding off to 14 days. Uh, if it's 13.1 or if it's 13.9 in both of the cases we round up to 14 days now we have already discussed why do we round off in this way uh, but in usually in a maths question 1.5 is considered as 2 and 1.4 is considered as 1 but in receivable or payable or in inventory turnover whenever we are talking about days 1.1 day also means 2 days okay so if I am saying to you that I will pay you the amount in 1.1 days. So this would mean definitely I am talking about the second day that is 2 days. Okay. So we will be rounding off to 14 days. So the question here arises my dear student whether trade receivable turnover should be less or whether it should be more. Uh, because trade receivable turnover is part of liquidity ratios family. Uh, as far as liquidity is concerned receivable days should be as less as possible. Because uh, as fast as we can recover payment from our debtors, there will be fewer liquidity problems for the business. Okay. Uh, and the thing is that the more the customer takes to pay, the more there are chances for bad debt that the customer will not pay altogether. So therefore, uh, the receivable day should be as less as possible. But the problem here arises that receivable days should be compared with the limit that we have allowed to our customers. Because if we are allowing our customers 30 days of credit and instead of allowing them 30 days of credit, then we start uh, calling them and texting them and visiting them uh, even after a week of sales. Uh, so therefore the customers will be annoyed. Why they will be annoyed? Because they would be annoyed that uh, your competitors will be offering 30 days, full 30 days of credit and you are now pressurizing them to pay early as possible. So therefore they will be annoyed and they will try to move their business if, if it's possible for them to, to your competitors. So overall in the long term you will be suffering because of lack of sales okay your sales will be lost so therefore it is recommended that receivable turnover should be according to the limit that we have offered to our customers it should be uh, somewhere around the limit if the limit is 30 days so it should be around 27 to for example 32 33 days not more than that okay uh, then after receivable turnover we have another ratio that is payable turnover payable turnover is also known as payable payment period now, how can we calculate payable turnover or payable payment period? The formula is very simple. Instead of trade receivables, we'll be using trade payables. And instead of credit sale, we'll be using credit purchases. Multiply by 365 because there are 365 days in a year. So the trade payables is already given in the question uh, that is 60,000 and credit purchase is 170. Uh, if the question does not mention that how much of the purchase is on credit, we'll be assuming that 100% purchase is on credit unless otherwise stated unless the examiner says that this much portion of the purchase or sales is on cash basis we'll be assuming all of the sales or purchase is on credit terms then multiply by 365 again trade payable turnover is 128 point something uh, whether it's 128.12 or whether it's 128.89 we will always be rounding off to 129 days so how, uh, how what does 129 days mean 129 days means that on average we are paying to our suppliers in 129 days. On average, it, it, we are taking 129 days to pay a supplier. Uh, then the problem here arises that payable days should be more or less. Uh, as far as liquidity is concerned, the payable turnover should be more and more as possible. Uh, why it should be more because my dear students that payable turnover basically trade payables is a free source of finance for the business so business want to juice up business want to extract as much as free credit as it can extract from our trade payables because uh, the more uh, we extend our trade payables 
the less is the amount that we need to invest in the business ourselves. Therefore, we want to play with the supplier's money as much as possible. And the best example for this, as you can see in the grocery supermarkets, such as these Walmart and in the local example, the NTR supermarket and all that, because they are selling all of the, the stuff grocery in cash and they are buying it uh, on credit so so that they do not have to invest their own money into the business okay they are basically doing business with suppliers money so more the trade payable is it's better for the business now the problem here arises if we extend credit period to more than it is allowed by the suppliers then our suppliers would be angry then our suppliers will be annoyed and maybe they do not supply us the money and supply the goods in the future why? Because uh, uh, we are not paying the amount to them on time. If we are not paying them timely, they will, uh, we will be risk that our supplies will be stopped or either they will continue the supplies but they will be charging very high prices to us because we are a high source of credit and we are, we are a risky customer. Okay. So therefore, if you do not want to, uh, and there is another point and that is for discount receive as well. If we are paying them late, so we will be foregoing the discounts to receive. We won't be getting the discount. So ideally, the trade payable turnover should be within the limit specified by suppliers. It can be two to four days higher, but not more than that. Otherwise, our suppliers will stop or refuse to supply us the money. So I hope my dear students, I was able to uh, uh, knowledge with you the concepts regarding ratios analysis.